So today we'll conclude this look at the book of Ruth, uh, fourth week into it. We'll look at the fourth chapter momentarily. Uh, but as we do that, it's important, first of all, to understand the events and the characters and the things that they did. But really, I urge you to make the effort to look beneath that and to see God's hand on each of these situations and, uh, and the whole story. Because Jesus is seen in every single book of the Bible. We know that we don't hear words from him until the New Testament but he is in the Old Testament. It was just a foreshadowing of who he was. You can literally see Jesus in every book. For instance, just to give you a little snapshot of what I'm talking about, in Genesis, a big picture we're talking here, Jesus is the seed of the woman who came after, you know, after, the, um, uh, uh, after the sin in the garden and everything. Uh, we took... Genesis chapter 3 talks about the seed of the woman. That, that's Jesus right there. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he is the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's a prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's our judge and our lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman and our redeemer. And I'll stop there. That's eight books into the Bible, conveniently stopped at Ruth. We could go on for the next 58 books of the Bible and show you how Jesus is in every single one. Just big picture, but all it would do is just confirm what I already said. So I'll just save some time now and move on to the text here. As I said, in Ruth, Jesus is this kinsman redeemer. It's that concept that we are reading about. And so we'll read chapter four and uh, we'll see how Boaz legally became that kinsman redeemer and what happened as a result. So beginning in Ruth chapter four, verse one, the word of the Lord says, meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought it I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, Tell me so I will know, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabites, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself, I cannot do it. Now in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Milan. I have also acquired Ruth, the Moabites, and Milan's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together build up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and, become, and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, 
whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The, the women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This, this then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his holy and perfect word. As we finish this look at Ruth, first I'd like to look at what the people did, first of all, the sort of the top layer, and then just peel back the layer a little bit and look at what that really means for us today. And I find it interesting, first of all, each time that I've read this before really studying it in depth, it never made an awful lot of sense to me why Boaz went about it the way he did. Why the two, phase, two phases to the deal here? First, he says there's a piece of land to which the Redeemer says, sure, I'll buy that. Then he says, oh, by the way, if you buy it, you get a woman with it. All along, we know Boaz doesn't want the man to redeem it. So why does he sort of lead him on and then sort of yank it away in a sense? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us, so we have to infer from what's there. Um, I think a couple things apply here. First of all, um, Boaz is trying to preserve this man's dignity and give him a way out. What I mean by that is if Boaz would have just said from the get-go, hey, um, he calls him a brother, he means relative. Our relative Elimelech died. He left a widow. She's old. She's not going to remarry, but she now has a daughter-in-law because her son uh, married and then he died. Well, this young woman, she would like to remarry and keep the name of her husband going. So will you marry her and buy the land together? If he would do something like that, I think what that would happen is that would greatly delay the process and possibly even um, put everything out of whack because he would think all of a sudden, wow, now there's a woman to deal with. What's her story? She's from Moab. What's going on here? Why is she here? Why isn't she in Moab? Why did her husband die? Why did her brother-in-law die? Why did her father-in-law die? There's a lot of questions going on here. Let's take some time. Let's sort this out. And so I think Boaz wanted to, at the very least, avoid this big um, issue that this would cause. Also, by doing it in two phases, remember, they're sitting in front of a town council of 10 men. So this kinsman redeemer, we don't know his name, he would probably feel obligated to do something to help a relative. And so this gives him an option. Hey, buy land. I'll help my family. I'll buy land. I look like the good guy here. Then Boaz says, by the way, there's a woman attached to it. Now he gives him an out. Okay, well, it seems if you read between the lines, the kinsman redeemer's probably up in age too. He's concerned about his estate he's going to leave for his children. And so because of that also, he's thinking, 
you know, well, we know in our, in our time, uh, if someone either divorces or becomes widowed, uh, if they go and remarry and they're older in life, well, doesn't that sometimes cause some friction with the other kids? Oh, now they're going to split our inheritance even more. And in the end, it's all about money, isn't it? So this kinsman redeemer, he doesn't want to open that can of worms here. He says, I have my estate in order. When it's my time to go, my kids know what they're going to get. I don't want to have to take on a second wife, which he probably would have been permitted to do under the law. We think that's weird, but it's thousands of years ago. He'd have to take on a much younger wife. Who knows if he'd be able to conceive children with her. And so it's a big issue again. Every way you look at it, this causes problems. But Boaz wanted to give him a convenient way out because Boaz didn't want this to happen at all. He, he wanted Ruth for himself. He's in love with her and he knows she wants to marry him too. I sort of think, you ever see the, the show Shark Tank? Um, if you haven't seen it, in short, these uh, investors, they're um, business owners, um, they go in front of these millionaire, billionaire investors. They're always looking to you know, make their money grow. And so they're trying to say, what a great product, what a great company I have, give me some money, and then we can, you know, I'll give you part of the company in exchange. Usually that's the way it works. Well, sometimes when you watch the show, and I know some of it's dramatized for TV too, but sometimes what happens is everything seems to be going well. I love your product. This is a great deal. I'm really interested. Then they say, I want more of the company to make it worth my while. And sometimes the person seeking the investment, then they, then they become a little more honest and they say, well, you know what? I already have... 50,000 investors out there, and they took so much of the company. I already have a little bit to offer you anyway. That can be the deal breaker. Sometimes it falls through later down the line is what I'm saying. And so in a really weird way, this is like an ancient version of the reverse of Shark Tank because rather than wanting an investor, Boaz wants to tell this man, you don't want any part of this but he sort of takes him down the line like he does want. And it's really, it's brilliant on behalf of Boaz, actually. It is, I think it's ingenious the way that he did it. And we see that God's hand was on it too. That's the most important thing. God wasn't going to allow this to work out any other way because God has a plan. And so the love story is complete. This kinsman redeemer says, nope, I can't do it. You can have the land, you can have Ruth, and God bless you both. And so Boaz redeems the land, he buys it, he marries Ruth. And when I uh, study this, here's another thing that pops in my mind. And I think, well, if I'm being uh, consistent with what we've looked at earlier in the book, back three weeks ago in chapter one, I said that God's law restricted Jewish people from marrying anyone from Moab. So does that not mean that Boaz here um, broke God's law by marrying Ruth? If we're being consistent, it looks like it. But this is where we have to be very careful when we look at God's law and when we interpret his word. It's not just to interpret it so that you know, what we want fits. That's not, not it at all. In Ruth 4, the marriage is celebrated and it is not condemned at all by the Holy Spirit's writing of it. So something else is going on here. We have to then look at that initial law. Why was that law put in place? Why did God not want Jewish people to marry anyone from Moab? Well, the reason is because of idolatry. They're pagans. They don't, they don't worship the one true God. So usually what's going to happen is if you go into other lands and then you start taking wives, they're going to bring their idols with them. And guess what? They're going to be brought into your home. They might even make it into the temple. And if you know anything about the Old Testament and the history of God's people, 
they had, that was a bad habit of them, bringing idols in. Read the book of Judges, for one thing. Constantly, idolatry, then we raise up a judge, idolatry, all that kind of stuff. So, in the situation here, we have to look specifically, is that the case with Ruth? Yes, she's from Moab, but she's not worshiping those pagan idols anymore. Because there was a point when Naomi said, you stay here, I'm going to go back to my homeland. Ruth cried and clung to her, and she said, your people shall be my people, and your God my God. From that point forward, she was converted. She's not, I mean, physically she was in Moab, but she's not of Moab anymore. She's one of God's children from that point forward. True, genuine conversion. There would be no chance whatsoever that she would bring any pagan idols or ideas into this marriage she literally physically left them in Moab. And that's how conversion should be for us. We leave our, our life in Moab and we're moving to Bethlehem. That stuff is, is completely separate anymore. So when we look at Ruth, only by virtue of her race is she from Moab. Nothing else is Moabite about her. I guess that's the word to use. And so um, that's why once she was converted, that freed up Boaz to marry Ruth. She's, as far as God's concerned, she's a Jewish person because she believes in the Jewish God. And that's okay. It would be different if in chapter one, Boaz takes a trip to Moab and sees this pretty young woman and says, I want to marry you and bring your idols with you into this, into this uh, marriage. That's different. That's big, that's black and white, night and day from what we're talking about here. So it's the faith that she has had. She left her idols, and that's why this does not fall under God's law anymore. That's the spirit of the law. That's why it was written like that. This is a very unique circumstance. So we can't say, oh, he, he married Ruth. Every other Jewish man can go to Moab and marry someone from there too. Doesn't work that way. It was a very specific, I don't know if you even want to call it an exception to the rule because it's, it's completely with the rule. It's with the spirit of the rule, not having idolatry brought into the one true faith. And uh, so... Uh, I think it's it's a fascinating study, actually, when you look at the history of God's people and their relationship with non-Jewish people. We think of the New Testament is different now, and now we are evangelizing the whole world, and back in the Old Testament, it was only Jewish people. Ruth shows that's not the case, but they had to come to faith. Faith in the Old Testament, faith in the New Testament, completely consistent. And... Furthermore, we can see this in the very beginning of the New Testament. In Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, he includes in there a genealogy leading to Jesus. If you take some time this afternoon or this week, look at that genealogy. Those are the, their names, and they don't mean much to us. There's, it's fascinating study, honestly. But specifically as far as what we're talking about here, is you can see in there several non-Jewish people playing a significant role in Jesus coming. As far as a Jewish person in the days of Jesus is concerned, that shouldn't happen because we're God's people. They're over there and we don't want anything to do with them. Ruth is mentioned in Matthew 1 verse 5. Uh, let me find it in my notes here. It says, Salmon father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, father of Jesse, and it goes on from there. Jesse's the father of David, second king of Israel. So you have a Gentile, poor Gentile widow from Moab being in the line of Dave, King David. Not only that, but 
Matthew gives us a detail in that genealogy, in that verse. We don't read anywhere else in the Old Testament, but apparently it was known among the Jewish people. It just wasn't recorded. And so the Holy Spirit um, inspired Matthew to include this detail. And I read it. I don't know if you caught it when I, because I didn't emphasize it. It says, Salmon, father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Do we remember who Rahab is? From the book of Joshua, the very beginning, they went in, they want to take Jericho, and she's a prostitute. She's a pagan prostitute who harbored uh, God's people and uh, some of the spies so they wouldn't be ratted out, basically. Hebrews chapter 11 gives us the Faith Hall of Fame. Who's also mentioned there? Rahab, the prostitute, because she had a conversion experience we don't know that she engaged in prostitution after that point. We assume she didn't. She came to faith. And so, just as elsewhere, God's word says that his people can't marry people from Moab. They can't marry the uh, Jebusites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Amalekites, probably even the termites if you read in there too. Um, <laughs> probably wouldn't want to marry termites, but I know the Bible doesn't say that little joke there. But we can't marry these people for the same reason. But Rahab's confession of faith opened her up and brought her into God's family. Now this man, we assume he's a Jewish man named Salmon, he can marry Rahab. And they then have Boaz, who is a wealthy, God-fearing, rich landowner, who then God brings together with Ruth all the way from Moab. And then they have Obed, who fathers Jesse, who fathers David. This is God's hand at work many, many years before Ruth. I don't know how long before um, Salmon and Rahab were. We could sort of guesstimate. It doesn't really matter at this for what we're looking at today. But these are pagans who are grafted into God's family through faith. And we talk about, we see, Paul writes about in the New Testament, it happened in the Old Testament too. We don't read about it often, but it is there. And so when you look at the lineage of Jesus, you have broken people, you have idolaters, people who are worshiping all sorts of different things. And what does that teach us? That they lead to Jesus. Jesus is the one who brings them all together under God, who changes them. They leave all of their pagan ways behind. To me, it boggles the mind. God's word, it just uh, is so interconnected in ways that just boggle the mind. In order to conclude our look, we have to wrap up, tie up the ends of Naomi. Just a moment or a minute or two here to look at her. She gets a happy ending. In verse 15, your grand, they, the women told her, your grandson will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Your daughter-in-law who loves you, who's better than seven sons, has given him birth. Keep in mind, there's no blood relation between Naomi and Obed. Okay, this was her daughter-in-law marrying some other guy, having a son. But under God's, in God's family, we're all related. I don't know what the really, I was trying to think of what it would be called. It really wouldn't be called any kind of relationship, really. But they say, he's your grandson. And she kept, she weaned him, she raised him. Uh, as a grandmother would. And that is a beautiful picture too. It's another way that God blessed this woman. First chapter, never would have expected that would happen. Here it's happening. And it was more than 10 years in the making, 10 years in Moab at least, plus some. I want to shift gears to the final point. Have to talk about this with Ruth. Uh, if you look at anything in Ruth, you have to look at the kinsman redeemer. That is Jesus. And so when you think of the concept of a kinsman redeemer, you're purchasing something for the benefit of another person. If Naomi could have afforded it, she wouldn't have needed a kinsman redeemer. 
So you're always doing it for someone else. And when you expend something on behalf for the benefit of someone else, that's called sacrifice. So by virtue, by nature of the kinsman redeemer, it's always a sacrificial position. Jesus is our sacrificial kinsman redeemer, paying for our sin with his blood. What did Jesus get out of it? It's not like we can repay him at all. We, we try to, I guess. We try to walk in righteousness, pray, do those things, go to church, read our Bibles. Nothing we could ever do could repay him. So what he did was absolutely the epitome of sacrifice. And that is why the kingdom redeemer is a perfect Old Testament picture of Jesus. And so there's so many other details um, I really had to whittle and narrow down what to share with you in the time that we have here this morning. Um, I find it fascinating, and I'm always learning new things, too, about it. But I just want to close by summarizing this idea of redemption. The story of Jesus' redemption plays through in every single book of the Bible, as I opened with earlier. But uh, we know that that story generally, that's the greatest love story. It's God's love for us and his willingness to sacrifice for us. Sacrifice and give the life of his son for us. That is the story of every single person who has ever called on the name of Jesus to be saved. You're living your life. We know the Bible says nobody's born a Christian. Nobody's born a believer. We come to a point in our life, some do it relatively early, some midlife, some later, but you get to a point where you have this epiphany. I think it's the Holy Spirit actually speaking to you, but whatever you call it, you realize that you cannot stand before God on Judgment Day on the basis of your own good works and expect for him to allow you into paradise. Can't happen because our best works are like filthy rags. So, we, what do we do about it? Well, we know that we need to call on the name of Jesus because he did the work for us. We get into heaven based on works. It's just not our works. It's the works of Jesus. And so that is redemption. We experience that when we come to him in faith and we repent of our sins and we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Jesus paid the price with his blood, and we believe that, and we walk in that knowledge every day. The gospel is the good news. That's what the word gospel means. And the good news tells us we do not have to live our lives separated from God. There is a way that we can get out of our spiritual poverty, just like Naomi got out of her physical poverty. We are Naomi in this story. We're in Moab. He draws us back to Bethlehem. There's nothing else we can add to the equation. And the gospel tells us that if we have ever strayed from him, if we know anyone, family, friends, loved ones, even if it doesn't apply to us, and we're doing what, honestly, we humbly know that we should Share this with your friends and family. Let them know you have never strayed too far. God can draw you back. There was a point, I'm sure nine years into Moab, people would have thought, there's no way Naomi's ever coming back. She came back and God blessed her greater than anyone ever expected. The message is so simple, a child can understand it. And the message is, if you have trusted in Jesus, just as Boaz and Ruth did with their union and their marriage, then you are a member of the family. You, the, uh, it's not, you know, daughter-in-law anymore. Naomi's calling Ruth my daughter. Things like that. These little details we see in the book of Ruth. And this child of Boaz and Ruth considered a grandson to Naomi. That's because God breaks down barriers that separate us and he unites us and joins us together. That should give us the greatest confidence to look forward to the glorious future and the hope that we know that the Bible tells us will last for eternity and it's only made possible 
by faith in Jesus Christ. Let us bow our heads and go to the Lord now in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for this book of Ruth. And I don't know among us here who, who had any expectations about this sermon series uh, three weeks ago when we started. Maybe not. It doesn't matter. But God, you just re continue to reveal yourself to us in ways that boggle our minds through the pages of Scripture and in the testimonies of your people. I'm, I know for a fact there are testimonies represented in the individuals seated here in this sanctuary this morning. Testimonies of your healing goodness, testimonies of your love and faith stories. And God, we just, we want to use those things to share the good news with others. You have brought someone along our path in the past who shared it with us. And now we want to do the same. We want the uh, kingdom to keep expanding. And it's a beautiful thing when and it is just like what we read in Ruth. God, we just, we can't thank you enough. You are the author and perfecter of our salvation. We know we can't add anything to that equation. But God, we just thank you for it. And each and every day, we ask that the Holy Spirit would hold our hands as we do our best to walk in righteousness and the ways of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen.